Hello and welcome to the B2B Content Show, a podcast about the how, what, and why of B2B content marketing. The show is brought to you by Conversa, a podcasting agency for B2B brands that want to start podcasts to connect with prospects, create content, and grow brand awareness. I'm Jeremy Shearer, and my guest today is Ellie Hildebrand. Ellie is Director of Content Marketing at Saligo, which is a business process automation platform. Ellie, hello. It's great to have you on the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So let's just jump right into our topic, which is how to structure content operations. And I want to start by asking you, what, what is content operations? How do you define that? <laughs> well, um, I'm sure there's a much more eloquent answer, but to me, content operations is just operationalizing the content strategy that you have, um, connecting the dots, streamlining your operations, s creating a process and sticking to it um, so that you and your teams can stay agile and collaborate and do your job, which is to create awesome content that actually drives results. Okay. Okay. So just to be clear, we're talking about the process that you put in place with strategy backed by data to, to produce the content and do it in the most efficient and effective way. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So why is, why is it important to have that structure, to have a content structure like that? Yeah. So, um, a lot of reasons. So there's, you know, we are always going to be, there's never going to be an end to content needs. There's never the content that's needed is not a discrete amount, right? You're as a content professional, you're serving your entire company. You're giving sales what they need. You're giving field teams what they need, giving customer service what they need. There's never going to be an end to it. And so we have to, as content professionals, figure out how to work smarter and do more with less. Um, so that the content we are spending our efforts creating, um, it can get as much mileage as it can, and we can make sure we're optimizing that. Um, so really, it comes down to working smarter um, and doing more with less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was on a call earlier today um, with a guy I'm going to be interviewing on on the show um, in a couple of weeks, and he brought up something pretty similar. He, he's a fractional CMO you know, hires himself out to SaaS companies in particular. And he said one of the things that he talks about most often with his clients is exactly doing more with less, being more efficient rather than just pumping out more and more and more content. Right. Creating better content and getting right. more juice out of it. Right. And so this is where operationalizing of the content strategy really comes in because, um, you know, if you don't have a way, like a method set up on the back end to measure your content so that you can optimize it, it's not going to be measured. And so it's really about thinking about the, you know, from a, from the idea of content to the output, the final output of it, that whole process, making sure it's a cycle that um, can feed off of each other so that you can be delivering outcomes and not just outputs. Um, because if you were, if you're delivering outputs, there will never be an end. Um, yeah, you're just cranking stuff out. Yeah, yeah. You're just a cog in a machine. And then, um, you know, I don't know, I've never been a part of a content team that had unlimited resources. Um, if there is that job, I, I want it, uh, it'd be, <laughs> like it'd be fun, but like we all as content leaders have to figure out how to do what we can with what we have. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I would argue that there's always a way to make a big impact, even if you have a team of one. Yeah, for sure. So now I would imagine that the structure of a content operation uh, will, you know, differ somewhat from company to company, depending on the team and all that. And, all, and I'm sure there are certain best practices, commonalities. So t d describe your own structure, the, the, the structure you've created at Saligo, kind of take us through it from beginning to end. Yeah, well, okay, I'll get there, but I want to answer a question that gets me there <laughs> first. Okay, sure. I got into the world of content. Um, it, it kind of just, we had the company I was at prior to this, we had a um, company reorg and our content writer was affected. And so I kind of, it came into my purview. And um, as I started learning more about content and 
kind of getting my head around the state of things at that previous company and what we had from a content standpoint and where we wanted to go, I, I realized, um, as I just kind of pulled at this thread, like we actually, despite having had a content writer, we never had a content strategy and we never had an, you know, a content operation. Um, we created all the content we created was basically ad hoc. It was, Mm. Hey, there's this, you know, someone wants this piece and we reacted and we spent all this effort creating a piece that then got tossed over the fence and never looked at again. It wasn't tied to, um, it wasn't tied to a business goal. It wasn't part of a greater collaborative effort. Um, it may have been part of a campaign here and there, but you know, the campaign wasn't tied to the rest of the organization. So there were, there was a lot of siloing happening not much collaboration and zero strategy. Um, And so, you know, like as I was kind of like continuing to work this problem and pull up this thread, I basically accidentally was doing a content audit and accidental because I was just trying to continue discovering and researching and digging. I didn't really realize that's what I was doing at the time, but, um, but that was kind of an aha moment for me. And I think there are a lot of companies out there who, are working their butts off to create content, but it's not part of a strategy. And, um, you know, it's not operationalized in a way where you can really get maximum impact from that. And so that really led me to, um, to develop this operations, um, operation process at my previous company and just kind of experiment as we went. Um, And I don't think there's one way to do it. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can and should do it based depending on, you know, what type of company you are and where you are in your content journey and all of that. Um, But I guess just the main point is that it's tied to a strategy. Um, So I'll walk through like kind of the things that I think are really important. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, it's going to be like, pick, pick and choose what's needed and go from there, make it your own. Um, okay. So first a content audit always is a first thing to do. Um, so that you can really understand where are we with our content? So mapping your content to persona, to where they are in their buying journey, um, to maybe it's industry or domains is what we use at Sligo. So Um, just thinking about it like that. How does your content, existing content map to those things? That leads you to identifying your high level content gaps. Okay. You know, where, where do we really need more coverage? Like our sales team has zero decision level content, whatever it is. Um, And all of that leads you to be able to put together a content strategy and calendar that is tied to those gaps and holes in your content and also tied to your business goals. Um, So I think that's one thing I've seen just not done well is, you know, you've got a great piece of content, but what business goal is it tied back to? Because if it's, if it's just a goal that your content team has, um, the rest of the organization isn't going to use it because it's, it's not what is motivating them. Right. What would, what would be an example of that? Um, You know, I think there's a lot of like, I think social media is an opportunity to get really creative and fun, which I love. I love that you can make content more human um, on a forum like Twitter or wherever. But uh, I think where a lot of companies can go wrong is it's not it's not tied to a business goal. It's not tied to a campaign. It's just, um, you know, these random posts that are going out in the internet, in the, in the black universe, black hole. And, um, and there's, there's nothing behind them to amplify them. So, you know, on the, on the other hand, if you have a social media strategy that's tied to your content, which is tied to a business goal, um, you can really amplify some of those posts with, you know, backing it up with the content that's created with customer stories, with, you know, all of the web pages you have. So, um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it does make yeah. sense. Right. I mean, and yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. That's more like spending a lot of time creating some cool post or video and it's kind of a one-off and yeah. you're like, wow, that was awesome. And you put it out there, 
but it's right. It's not integrated into the larger plan. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess you could always try to justify it by like, well, this is, it's brand awareness, you know, right. which is kind right. of like amorphous enough to potentially justify just about anything you yeah. want to do. <laughs> which I, I am come from a PR and comms background. So I am, you know, I believe in brand awareness and I don't think that's not important, but yeah, it is, it, it's, um, any content that's created needs to be tied to a strategy basically. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Take us, keep taking yes, us. Okay. The so, process. and then, um, a project management tool. So we use Asana, um, and there's plenty of great ones out there. I just spoke with a, a, um, peer of mine who uses Smartsheet and swears by it. So I, I think there's several good options. Um, but for us, what having a project management tool like Asana has allowed is collaboration over silos. So we have an intake form where we can capture any and all content requests. So a field, some, you know, a salesperson's having a conversation with a prospect and they're like, we don't have this really critical piece of content that I need to deliver. They can submit an intake request and we will address it um, and see how it fits into our strategy. So that's a big piece is having the intake form, which feeds, can feed your content strategy. So, you know, you have this strategy that you've identified the content gaps. Um, that said, it should be fluid because you need to be able to react and respond to right. these needs that you're seeing. Um, so I think having a strategy that's not static having a strategy that can be fluid and that you can react and respond to needs. Um, and Asana is a great way for us to operationalize that process. Mm -hmm. So um, in addition to requests, we just have like ideas that come in through there that we have in a column and it's, you know, we revisit that monthly and say like, this is really a good idea and this is a trend we're seeing and this is filling this gap in our strategy let's pull it forward. So just having like fodder to pull from has been really great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so you just, it, it lets you capture that constant flow of ideas from across the entire organization and from the people who are in the trenches using the content on the front lines. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we've done in Asana is we've got templated tasks so that, you know, if we're writing a blog post, we know the you know, 15 critical steps that we absolutely can't skip. Um, and, you know, a blog post is a simple example, but when you have these bigger content efforts, like a huge campaign or a huge ebook, there's so many details that should never be overlooked, but do if you're moving and operating without that kind of punch list. So um, I think one thing that happens a lot is you'll spend hours working on a great ebook and you'll put it on the website and do an email nurture and that's it. And then it, you know, it doesn't get more mileage. So um, having like a very clear process for how the content's distributed, does it, which teams need to be notified and how, um, you know, having social media posts already created, all of that stuff that's very simple. It doesn't take, you know, a rocket scientist to know these things, but just operationalizing it so that it doesn't get skipped because you're moving so fast and you're trying to do so many things that if it's not there, it won't happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing that lets us do having the templated tasks is um, not start from scratch. So we have a process we follow for all of this. And I'll just say in general about Asana and or a project management tool is this idea um, I feel like there's often an unspoken objection for people who aren't, uh, you know, project management people where they're like, we don't have time for, like, we're moving so quickly. We don't have time mm -hmm. to be doing this step and checking off this box in Asana. And um, that is just, it's, it's such bogus. And um, I would, <laughs> I would argue um, you, you are moving so fast that you can't afford not to have a project management tool. Um, and it's all the more reason that you absolutely need one. And, um, I'm sure you've heard the, the quip 
smooth is steady, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah. I actually have not heard that before. I'm here. You haven't heard it? Okay. It's, I think it's a military, <laughs> maybe okay. Air Force or some term, but yeah, we used that a lot at a previous company I was at. And it's the idea that you have to slow down in order to smooth out your process. Mm. Okay. And once you get a smooth process, you can go really quickly. It's kind of the idea of like measure twice, cut once. Okay. Right. Um, so just setting things up on the front end so that you can do your job and deliver great content really smoothly and that you don't have to have this big tangled jumble of a mess to deal with once the content's created. You have a process and you just have mm -hmm. to, all you have to do is what you're great at, which is writing and creating great content and just follow that process and you yes. get confidence that it's serving a, a purpose that makes sense we're yes. creating it in a way that's efficient and it's actually going to be useful yes exactly um and then the other thing asana lets us do uh is we've got a single ingress and egress point for all of our content so everything that comes in comes into one place you know, it comes in to that intake form or somebody adds a task to a project um, and we work on it and then it goes out in one place too. And what that lets us do is like almost have a dashboard place to track everything we're working on. Um, and we, this kind of goes hand in hand, but we've got a shared calendar in Asana so that all of the other teams can look at that and see and have full visibility and transparency into what content's being created and when it's mm -hmm. coming. Um, or if a, if a piece of content got blocked, they can look at that. So just creating this place for everyone to have visibility, shared visibility, mm -hmm. um, so that we can have more collaboration. And one of the things that happens, which I love when my team does this, is someone will see something on the calendar that they're not necessarily a collaborator on, but they just happen to click and be there and they'll see it and they'll say, oh my gosh, that would make an awesome animated ad. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes me so happy. Like that's the, those are the really cool things that can happen. That collaboration that happens, starts to happen organically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how we think about Asana and the project management piece. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And well, it's sounds... iterative. Right. I, it sounds really useful, right? Yeah. You, you have to have something like that. Yeah. And it sounds like it has all kinds of benefits, like you just described, sparking new ideas. Yes. Sparking creativity. Uh, and, and I would think, too, that um, it also makes it easier to say no when a request comes in for something that maybe previously you just would have been like, well, okay, they say they need it. But now yeah. because everything is linked to a, a business objective, you could say, well, actually, no, this is not high priority. And here's why. Definitely. Yeah. And that goes back to the content audit that you've already done, because you can say, we actually have, you know, over a dozen customer stories in this really small industry. We're not doing any more of those because we, mm. but if you don't have that, you're shooting in the dark. And um, I think yeah. that happens a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's getting shared visibility and account and, um, you know, making sure all the stakeholders know these are our gaps and this is why we're prioritizing these pieces of content and saying no to these ones. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I like you say, if you don't have something like that in place, then you're just on a treadmill. Yes. Endlessly. Right. Yes. Um, not great. Yeah. And so the, the, the last two pieces of like con what I would say are co is content operations is distribution flow and a process for maximizing the mileage out of your content. So mm -hmm. do you have a process in place for we created, we did a great customer interview and here are the 12 things we can create from that one effort rather than we just did a written case study and then that was it. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is having a way built in to measure its performance and optimize, um, which just, it's so funny that people don't do this because it's, um, it's like I said, it's going back to this idea of working smarter, like rather than creating a whole new piece of content, 
if something's not performing well, let's try to rebrand it or repackage it and get it out there and see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, uh, you know, a big part of what I believe is, um, using real data and not opinions. Like you can't ever really know, you can guess if a content's going to perform well, but you can't ever really know until you get it out in the market and test it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of what, um, uh, what we do. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, I, you know, I don't think anyone would argue against that. It, it's yeah. otherwise you're just kind of throwing stuff out there and hoping it works, but you really have no right. clue if it's working or not. So, right. Yeah. You have, there has to be some way to measure it. So, some, yeah. some data to at least point you in, in one direction or another. Yeah. And like a process built in for doing that, like a good cadence for that. Um, mm -hmm. like a lot of this stuff is not, it's not rocket science. It's just really simple, but it's a matter of operationalizing it so that it actually happens. Right. right. Yeah. And it, that it happens consistently every time the same way. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a really good overview of your process. There's a lot, um, a lot of moving parts and pieces to it, but like you say, no, it's not, it's not super complicated. It's just mm -hmm. pretty con like con sort of common sense steps in place. It's just, mm -hmm. they, it's I, and I guess it's easy to overlook that or just like, it does take time to implement that stuff if you don't already have it. Right. Yeah. It's like the, the idea, like slow is steady and smooth and steady is fast or slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people are like, I don't have time to slow down and set this up. Um, and that probably means you're just going too fast. Like you, you have yeah. to slow down. So what's your, what's the takeaway for marketing teams? Like where you were at your previous company, you kind of realize like, oh man, we don't, don't really know yeah. exactly what we're doing here. How do you, I mean, you've mentioned the audit is probably the first step. Yeah. But yeah. Like, you know, but like if you're in a company culture where there's, that's never been done and, you know, there's sort of not part of the culture, but, but you're in marketing and you realize, oh, we really need to do this. How do you initiate that? Yeah. Um, you know, there's, it's just, it's different for every, for every situation. But I think at the end of the day, like it, your content has to be tied to a strategy. You have to have a strategy. You have to be smart about it. Like you, like I said, at the beginning, there's never an end to the content that's going to be needed. You know, our job as a content professional, isn't like create this amount of work. It's not a discrete number. It's, it's incessant. And time is a non-renewable resource. And so you have to get smart about what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. And, um, and really like not just create outputs, um, you know, yeah. not just create these things that you throw over the fence and then you move on to the next thing, but really thinking about outcomes and strategy and, um, and just working smarter. Yeah, for sure. Well, Ellie, so a lot of great stuff here. Um, how can people reach out to you if they want to connect yes. and discuss this? Yes. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm Ellie Hildebrand. I'm also on uh, Instagram, but that's mostly just, you know, things that I think my kids do that are do adorable, but other people probably wouldn't care about them. <laughs> so yeah, LinkedIn's probably the best. You can also drop me um, an email at ellie.hildebrand at saligo.com. Um, I could talk about this stuff all day. It's really fun to me. I am um, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm a, a very much a creative who has uh, gets frustrated of, at my type A side for organization and structure. And those two things are usually in conflict, but in this role, they actually work together really well. Um, so I, I do get excited about this. It's really fun. And um, I'm always glad to talk about it with anyone. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you're in a good place. And, uh, and, and thank you so much. I mean, yeah, that excitement came through loud and clear. It's, it's super interesting. And um, thank you for sharing those, that process and your insights. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me.